welcome to the distinguished lecture series of the Indian Mathematics Consortium. The aim here is to host virtual colloquia by some of the best researchers and expositors around the world. The speakers are carefully chosen by the scientific committee from among mathematicians who are not only distinguished researchers but are also known for the quality of their exposition. The principal aim here is to make the talks as widely accessible as possible, especially to PhD students. With this in view, the format of most of the talks will be in two stages. First, there will be a pre-recorded talk by the speaker, which will be posted online. Interested audience can then view this at their leisure and communicate questions, if any, to the organizers. The second stage will be a live interactive session between the speaker and interested participants and that will be held about two weeks after posting the online talk. The approximate duration of the talk will be about 45 minutes and that of the interactive session will be about half an hour. The Distinguished Lecture Series is co-hosted by IIT Bombay and ICTS Bangalore. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Melanie Matchett Wood from Harvard University with us today. Um, she's professor at Harvard and uh, Radcliffe alumni professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Number theorist with broad interests in algebraic geometry, topology, and probability. Amongst the numerous recognitions uh, she has achieved, uh, she has been awarded the Morgan Prize in 2004. She was a Minerva Distinguished Professor at Princeton in 2018. Uh, she was the AWM Microsoft Research Prize. She won the AWM Microsoft Research Prize in Algebra and num Number Theory in, again, 2018. Um, her work has a considerable range and uh, I'll just mention a few, including this very recent and beautiful work that she's going to be telling us about. Uh, one of her outstanding papers was on the asymptotics of discriminants in the growth and decreasing um, from six, seven years back. And there's a remarkable piece of work combining group theory, random graphs, and Picard groups or sandpile groups of, of random graphs um, where she combined probability along with uh, number theory, group theory, algebraic geometry. And this very recent work, she is going to tell us about three manifold groups and their finite quotients and uh, what possible tuples, finite tuples of uh, finite groups are possible and not possible. We all look forward to this talk. Thank you. Hello. So everything I talk about today is going to be a joint work of, of Will Sawin and myself, uh, of Melanie Matchett Wood. And I'm going to be talking about finite quotients of three manifold groups. And I'll say here what I mean by that. So we'll consider M a compact oriented three manifold. meaning it's a three-dimensional manifold and without boundary. So these are usually called closed three manifolds. And these are somewhat hard to draw in our three-dimensional world, but we can think of some simple examples. Um, one way you can get a three-dimensional manifold is to take 
the circle S1 cross S1 cross S1. So here's one S1. And when we take S1 cross S1, we get the torus. And then if we cross it with another S1, we can get a, a three manifold there. Now maybe another easy way to make a three manifold is to take S2 cross S1. So S2 here is the surface, uh, the boundary of a three-dimensional sphere. So it's this two-dimensional surface pictured here. And we, we take the product of that and a circle S1, we can get a compact three manifold. Um, and then another nice example is S3, which is the boundary of a four-dimensional solid sphere. So that's what I mean by a three manifold. So what's a three manifold group? Well, one of the important ways that we study topological spaces is through certain algebraic invariants and maybe the most fundamental uh, invariant is what we would call pi one of M, uh, the fundamental group. And so this is the group of loops in M that start at some point and go around in the space and come back um, up to homotopy. So if we can sort of squish around one loop into another, we would consider these two loops that I have drawn, say, this one in red and this one in yellow to be the same because those dotted paths there indicate a way that within the manifold M, I maybe move one loop um, to the other. And then they form a group um, under concatenation because we can follow one loop and then follow the other. And that is a way that we can um, we can compose, so we can follow, oops, follow this path and then follow some other loop and that um, gives us another loop. So in our examples here, um, S1 cross S1 cross S1 has fundamental root Z cubed essentially because Z is the fundamental group of S1 and S2 has trivial fundamental group and S2 cross S1 just has Z as its fundamental group. And S3 has trivial fundamental group. Every loop in S3 can be contracted to a point. So these fundamental groups of three manifolds, three-dimensional manifolds have been well studied in a lot of different ways with a lot of different questions that one could ask about them. And in recent years, there have been many deep results. And any of those could <laughs> merit their own long talk. Uh, but instead today, I'm going to talk about the finite quotients of these groups. and it, relatively new flavor of question. And here's the basic question. What finite groups can be quotients? Of the fundamental group of a three dimensional manifold. And then in what combinations? So the first with Without the second part, the first question sounds like a natural question to start with. What finite groups can be quotients of the fundamental groups of three manifolds? But we're going to see that that has a relatively easy answer. Um, and it's going to lead us to this uh, more refined question. So to answer this first question, which I said was going to be easy, we'll 
look at another example of a three manifold. And I'm gonna build this one by gluing two pieces together. So I'm gonna draw what's called a genus G handle body. Here, my G will be three. And I'm gonna draw another copy of it. So this two copies of the same space. And so this is a solid three-dimensional space with boundary, okay? So it's called the genus G handle body and its boundary is this surface, the genus G surface that you see on the outside. So like if G was one, this would be the donut. Uh, not just the torus, the surface of the donut, the actual whole donut with all the yummy insides. So um, this, like I said here, this, this handle body of which we have two copies is a three-dimensional manifold with boundary because when you hit that, hit that edge, that surface, it's, it doesn't look quite like a three-dimensional space. And so how we're gonna build M is we're gonna glue these two HG and HG by identifying their boundary with the identity map on the boundary because they have two copies of the same thing. They have literally the same boundary. So I can glue this point to this point and I glue this point to this point. Now it's hard to imagine doing that in three-dimensional space, but I can do that abstractly. And that builds a three manifold and the three manifold that I build that way, one can use the Van Kampen theorem and compute its fundamental group and it's FG, the free group on G generators. And so this group has a lot of finite quotients. Of course, it has every finite group at, that can be generated by G elements as a quotient and I could do this for any G and only G equals three is pictured, but I could do that for any positive integer G. So we see that any finite group can be a quotient of a three manifold group. Which brings us to the um, second part of our question in what combinations? So this free group on G generators, it has all the finite groups that can be generated by G elements as quotients, but none of the other finite groups as quotients. So that's some relation on sort of what combinations we can see occurring. And I'll give one, one other example with a three manifold with a slightly interesting fundamental group. So this example will be the quotient of S3, the three sphere, the boundary of the four dimensional uh, ball by a group called the binary icosahedral group. Okay, and so this is a manifold that's called the Poincaré homology sphere constructed by Poincaré. Um, and let me tell you a, a little bit more about this group, this binary icosahedral group. It's a group of order 120 and it sits inside the special orthogonal group in four dimensions. So it acts on that four dimensional ball. And so it acts on its boundary S3. And then that's how we get the quotient. And also, if you think about finding groups, you might want to know that it's isomorphic as a finite group to SL2F5. So if you don't know <laughs> what this group is, uh, maybe that doesn't give you much to imagine. So I'll tell you another way to sort of imagine building this point gray homology sphere. One can start with a dodecahedron. So I'm gonna 
I try to draw here a quick sketch of a dodecahedron. So we have this dodecahedron, and if we imagine it filled in solid so that it's a three-dimensional manifold with boundary, if we could somehow, again, glue its faces, we could get rid of that boundary. And we're going to do that by actually just identifying faces with other faces. So you start with the dodecahedron, and you identify each face with the opposite face. And you can sort of look through your dodecahedron. If you have one side like this, the opposite face is flipped around. It looks like this. So to identify them, you're going to have to do something uh, to the pentagon. And one thing you can do is you can rotate it by the smallest possible rotation, a pi over five rotation. Um, to identify each face with the opposite face, and you do that gluing, and that uh, creates a three manifold that is this point gray homology sphere. And its fundamental group is this binary icosahedral group, otherwise known as SL2F5. And SL2F5 is almost a symbol group. So it does not have many quotients. The only quotients are. SL2F5, PSL2F5, which is a simple group, and the trivial group. So here we see um, some sort of different combinations of finite quotients that can appear from some three manifold groups. So now I want to be a little more precise about what kind of question do I mean by in what combinations? Like what would an answer to that question look like? Here's a more precise question. Given finite groups, G and H, is there a three manifold group with G as a quotient? But not H. So this question can have different answers depending on G and H. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes for silly reasons, and as we'll see, sometimes for less silly reasons. So let me start with a sort of silly reason. Here's a silly reason the answer could be no if H is a quotient of G <laughs> itself. Then if you have G as a quotient, you have H as a quotient. That would be a silly reason. And of course, in that case, the answer is always no. So I don't want to quite call this um, silly, but let me give you an easy yes uh, based on some things that we've already said. So if G, for example, is SL2F5 and H is some bigger group like GL2F5, even though that's only a little bigger, perhaps. So We have right here a three manifold that has SL2F5 as a quotient, but it doesn't have H as a quotient because SL2S5 is in fact the entire three manifold group. So we see by the example, so yes, sort of by example. So whenever you know an example of a three manifold group, you can get some yes answers. So for example, you could, if G is, uh, the symmetric group on two letters, and H is the symmetric group on three letters. We could also say yes by example, because we had an example above where pi one of M would say Z, or we could have taken Z cubed, um, which will have S2 as a quotient, but not S3 as a quotient, since S3 is not abelian. So now, I want to give some less obvious answers that
uh, from the recent work of, of Will Solomon and myself and our paper um, on this topic is on the archive. So you can look there if you wanna read more about this. And so in that paper, for example, we give what is not quite such a silly no. So if G, so I'm gonna build a group as a semi-direct product here. I'm gonna take SL2 F3 acting on F3 squared in precisely the way you expect SL2 F3 to act on F3 squared um, uh, as you know, matrix multiplication on column vectors. So if this group is a quotient, of pi one M, we show that then this bigger group, which will have two copies of F3 squared with SL2 F3 acting, uh, just acting independently in the standard representation on each F3 squared. So this H is a bigger group. Um, and we show that it is also a quotient of pi one M. So this is not silly because H is very much not a quotient of G, it's bigger. So we say, if you find a three manifold group that has this group as a finite quotient, it actually has to have this bigger group as a quotient as well. So that's an example where the answer to this question here is no, but it's perhaps not, not so obvious and it really involves here the topology of three manifolds in some real way. And now, let me also give an example of a much harder yes answer. So I'm gonna take G to be, again, a semi-direct product. I'm gonna take Z mod three cross Z mod five, so the cyclic group of order three and five. Uh, and I'm gonna take the semi-direct product with the quaternion group. And so Q8 has to act on Z mod three and uh, Z mod five. And it's gonna do that through its two characters. It has two characters to plus or minus one. And it's gonna act on Z mod three through one of those characters and Z mod three through the other. So that gives us a group of order 120. And so what is the yes? I have to tell you that certain three manifolds exist. So in fact, I'm gonna give a lot of yes answers. So for each positive integer n, there exists a closed oriented three manifold where the fundamental group of the three manifold has G as a quotient. But I'll put this in quotes, no other quotients. Of order less than or equal to n. So I had to put in quotes because that can't be technically true because G itself has some quotients like the quaternion group and the trivial group. So what that really means is all quotients of the three manifold group of order at most n are quotients of G of this group of order 120. All right, and this, this I say for each n there exists a three dimensional manifold. That n very much will depend on n. But what it says, one way of thinking about this is that we can find three manifolds who from the lens of finite quotients look more and more like their fundamental group is just G, this particular group of order 120. In fact, we study topology on the space of groups in which these groups have, as n goes to infinity as their limit, this, this group G here. And so what makes this yes, I mean, not only maybe not obvious if you don't um, know a lot of examples of, of three manifold groups, uh, it 
you may not know, maybe someone just has, has some group, just like our, our easy, easy yeses here. Um, but it's, it's not like, for example, this uh, first, first easy yes here because of the following. So, you know, if G were SL2 F5, <laughs> this would be easy, this kind of statement, right? Because we could just, for every N, we would just literally take the um, point gray homology sphere up here where pi one is that group. Um, and that would satisfy having G as a quotient, but no other quotients, okay? Um, but this G, and it's called sometimes a generalized quaternion group, is not the fundamental group of a three manifold for any M. And that, how we know that is actually quite an interesting story. So I'm gonna take a little historical aside to tell you a little bit about finite groups that could be the fundamental groups of three manifolds and how our knowledge of that has evolved. So, Hoff in 25 classified finite subgroups of SO4. So just like SL2F5, which we also call the binary icosahedral group is a subgroup of SO4 and that let us build a three manifold with that fundamental group. You can do that for any finite subgroup of SO4. Um, and so I'm gonna call this so we can refer to it. This is list A. So it's some list of groups. It's got some families in it. So it's an infinite list, but it's a nice uh, classification. And so list A are all actual fundamental groups of three manifolds, like I said. So one thing you can work out just from the algebraic topology is that any finite three manifold group has what's a condition on its group cohomology which is called periodic cohomology of period four. Right here, four is, is three plus one um, coming from the three-dimensional manifold. And then you could just ask group theoretically, well, what are the finite groups that have this property on their group cohomology that have periodic cohomology of period four? And so Zassenhaus in 36 in the solvable case, and Suzuki in 55 more generally classified these groups with the periodic cohomology. And I'll call this list B. And of course, since the things in list A are indeed uh, finite three manifold groups, we have that everything in list A is in list B. But there were some things on list B that weren't on list A. You might wonder, well, maybe via some other construction, they could still be three manifold groups. But this was studied by various people, including Milner um, and Lee from the 50s through the 70s. And they found reasons why most of the families and groups that were on list B, but not on list A, couldn't actually be pi one of M for some other reason other than, you know, some question of periodic cohomology. In fact, they did this eventually by work of Lee um, for everything except the generalized quaternion groups. And so this group um, here, this G that I was talking about, is the first example of one of these generalized quaternion groups. 
so that meant that we knew that the finite three manifold groups were, you know, everything we knew back from list A and then possibly the generalized quaternion groups or possibly not. Um, however, there's a good guess of what the truth should be um, because it followed from Thurston's geometrization conjecture. And so when Perlman in 2003 proved geometrization, that in particular implied what's often called Thurston's elliptization conjecture, which in our notation here, we can just shorthand as saying list B equals list A. And so indeed, uh, the only way that we know that this or any, this generalized quaternion group or any group in this family is not pi one of M uh, is through Perlman's work, which that was the, the <laughs> deepest, most difficult work we've seen in three manifold topology. So this is not, uh, not an easy, easy fact to see. And perhaps in, with some strange hindsight, this fact can help us think about why it was so hard to prove that these quaternion groups were not three manifold groups, even though all the other groups from, from list B that weren't in list A eventually fell to some group theoretic techniques. It's because there are actual real three manifold groups that look essentially arbitrarily close to these generalized quaternion groups. And so maybe that sort of provided a fundamental obstruction to any arguments only really going through the group theory of finite quotients to, to see that these groups were not three manifold groups. Okay, all right. So that was a long historical aside. Let's go back to our question. Here, given these given two groups, is there a pi one m with g as a quotient, but not h? So we saw some easy, silly yes, no answers, some less obvious, kind of interesting examples of no when you know there couldn't be a three manifold, and yes when there there could be these these three manifolds that sort of approximate uh, the generalized quaternion group. You can think, well, we could just keep doing more and more examples. But what we do in our work is that we just answer this question for all G and H. So for every pair of a finite group and a finite group H, we tell you what the answer is, and I, it has to be in some terms. And so in terms of the group cohomology of finite groups. So basically in terms of the group theory of these finite groups that you're asking about, we can tell you a statement in topology about whether there exists a three manifold with one group as a quotient, but not the other. Okay, so how do we do that? What, is, what does that answer look like? So it essentially looks like two theorems. Um, theorem A, oh, actually, just so we don't get confused with the A and B above, I'll call it theorem one. Uh, theorem one, in which we prove topological obstructions to certain three manifold groups. And we say, you know, you can't have a three manifold group that has, you know, this kind of finite quotient and not this kind of finite quotient. So that's how we, we provide 
this no example above. And we prove those topological obstructions using techniques from what I would call sort of traditional algebraic topology techniques. Um, we use Poincaré duality and Euler characteristic and Haggard splittings. I'll say a little bit more what those are and cobordism. to prove that certain things are just not possible with three manifolds. But then how do we prove when things are possible? So when theorem one doesn't apply, we show there exists an M with fundamental group with G as a quotient, but not H via a probabilistic method. So indeed for a certain notion of random three manifold, we show that with positive probability a random three manifold will have G as a quotient, but not H. This, of course, is a strategy that has a beautiful history, especially in combinatorics, to produce graphs that have certain kinds of properties. Um, and we use it here to produce three manifolds that have certain kinds of properties. All right, so I want to finish by telling you a little bit more about these two theorems. So that's, that's the sort of overview. Now for theorem one, I wanna give you the sense that these obstructions are not so complicated. Um, so let me just tell you what they look like. If I have an irreducible representation of the fundamental group, of a three manifold over a finite field. And these are relevant, of course, since we're caring about finite groups. Then we show four things hold. And this is the entirety of the things that hold in the sense that, you know, this theorem two provides some kind of converse. Uh, it says, at least as far as this question of if there exists a three manifold with G, but not H as a quotient, you know, if one of these four things doesn't tell you no, then the answer is yes. Okay, and so what, what are these things? So first, there is a statement that the dimension of the first group cohomology of the representation should equal that of its dual. There's a condition that for each non-zero element of H2 of pi one of M, there exists some buddy, some beta in H1 of the dual such that their cup product integrates to something non-zero of over the manifold. Okay, so that the integral over the manifold of the cup product of these two classes is not zero. And these are more or less from Poincaré duality. The second one I hope looks a little bit like some kind of Poincaré duality thing. So these are not difficult uh, conditions, but we have to put them on our list because we're trying to give a complete complete list, all right? And then the third condition is, is V is symplectic. So a representation is symplectic if it preserves a non-degenerate alternating bilinear form um, and the characteristic is odd, uh, then the dimension 
of the group cohomology with coefficients here in V is even. So there's a parity um, condition on the dimension here. And then the fourth condition is a similar one, um, but it's for characteristic two and a slight variation on a symplectic representation called the affine symplectic representation. And the, the parity is still determined. It's not always even, it's a little more complicated, but we'll just say it has parity determined by uh, the integral of some class over the, the manifold. So it's just like a, as often characteristic to, and <laughs> it's slightly more complicated. It's like a slightly more complicated version of theorem three. And so these, these two parts here, these are really the new, um, new results. And three gives our no example above where we had this, you know, G equals F3 squared semi-direct SL2 F3. All right, so that's how, how we got that no. Um, and what I'm telling you is that in fact, theorem one gives you all no answers to the question of is there a pi one m with g as a quotient, but not h because theorem two tells you that when theorem one doesn't apply, um, we can produce, produce such three manifolds. And so what is this probabilistic method? So this goes back to Dunfield and Thurston in 2006, who introduced a model of a random three manifold. They actually suggested several models of random three manifolds, but the one that they really started to investigate and consider um, is a model of random Higgard splittings. And I'll say, say what that is. And in particular, they dreamed that uh, this model of random three manifolds might be used to produce you know three manifolds with with some properties that maybe couldn't produce by be produced by just hands-on methods and you know that's that's the kind of thing that we are doing in our work okay so remember this picture before where we had two genus g solid three-dimensional handle bodies with these G-dimensional or genus G surface boundaries. Well, we're gonna glue them together, but before we glued them, we glued them by identifying their boundary with the identity map. Well, there are other maps between a surface of genus G and um, a surface of genus G. So we could maybe, instead of mapping this point to this point, we could map it over here. And then we might have to map this nearby point to something over here and so forth. Um, so if we glue, not with the identity, but with a random uh, homeomorphism of the boundary surface, so this surface of genus G and those homeomorphisms of the boundary we'll call MG. And this is the mapping class group of genus G. And Dunfield and Thurston give a nice way of you taking a random element in here where you take a random walk on some generators and it doesn't in the end depend on which generators you, you chose. Um, what we, at least what we study about this question. So um, once, once you now have this random homeomorphism and you uh, glue your genus G handle body to itself with um, that, that random map, that gives what's called the Hager splitting. Um,
And in fact, every three manifold arises this way for all sufficiently large G. So, but not, not for every G. Um, so then to get a good model, um, we want to let G go to infinity. And if we study this random model of the three manifold as G goes to infinity, we'll get all, all three manifolds. Um, and so then, you know, so this just to review, this starts with a random element of the mapping class group that produces a manifold. It has a fundamental group and, um, in my work with Solomon, we give in this limit as G goes to infinity, the limiting distribution of these three manifold groups as far as finite quotients are concerned. So what I'll call the profinite completion, what everyone calls the profinite completion. So this is a group associated to pi one of M, which just sort of contains exactly the information about the finite quotients of M. So that's just another way of saying it. It's like the information of what finite quotients pi one has. And so we give entirely the, uh, describe explicitly the distribution of these collections of finite quotients for random three manifolds. Um, and it wouldn't have had to be this way that this works out to give, you know, such a, a, a converse to theorem one. It could have been the case that there were things that were possible, but they happen with probability zero. You know, in this limit as G goes to infinity, you could have, you know, you can have three manifolds that, that uh, occur. In fact, any particular um, homeomorphism type of, of three manifolds occurs with probability zero. So you could be worried that there would be sort of yes answers to the existence of three manifolds with G, but not H as a quotient that existed, but not with positive probability. But it just turns out we're lucky that doesn't happen. <laughs> so we just check what this, uh, what we get explicitly in this distribution. And we see that when theorem one doesn't tell you no, then there, there is a positive probability. So stronger than the existence of a single three manifold, I mean, it gives you also a hyperbolic three manifold and just a whole lot of them uh, that a random M has G, but not A as, as a quotient. All right, so how do we do this? How do we get <laughs> this limiting distribution? So we use some of the work of Donfield and Thurston from when they first introduced the model. And our main new input uh, is new work on the moment problem for random groups. So. Very briefly, Dunfield and Thurston found something like the limiting moments of these random groups. And we show using also theorem A, uh, or sorry, theorem one and, and parts three and four, these new parts crucially uh, yeah, especially three and four, um, that the the moments of the random groups computed by Dunfeld and Thurston, in fact, describe a particular distribution that we can give explicitly. And so just to give you a little bit of flavor of what that explicitly looks like, I'll give one corollary. So you can see one probability, one actual probability. So let's say S is a finite set of primes, then we can define it's pro S completion of a 
three manifold group. And so this is the, this is the thing that sees all the quotients, sees all quotients to S groups. So S groups are like P groups, but for all the primes in P, they, their orders are products of all the primes in, in S. So this sees all the quotients to S groups. And we prove that the limit of the limiting probability that say the Perez completion is trivial. So, and this is the same as saying prime one of M has no S group quotients is the product over the primes in S of a product from J from one to infinity of one plus P to the minus J. So that's more than one. I wanna make it more like a probability to the minus one. And then here we have a product over non-abelian simple S groups. And so this was actually secretly here a product over the abelian simple S groups. Uh, but the um, factor looks a little bit different because the group theory of abelian and non-abelian simple groups is a little different. And this is E to the minus the sure multiplier of the non abelian group times the size of the outer automorphism of the group. So that minus and fraction is all in the exponent of the E. So this is, gives you a little bit of sense of the flavor of what I mean. We sort of can write down these, these probability distributions explicitly. We can give these explicit formulas like this, and then you can um, see, for example, that this probability here is positive. Um, because we know from the classification of finite simple groups that there should only be finite many products here. And this is a finite product. And so you can see that, that this is, is not zero. Hi, thank you.